If you want to get to where you're going, it helps to know where you are. You're probably going to need a map. Humans have been charting their place in the world for thousands of years, and the aesthetic quality of maps can range from the purely functional to the absolutely beautiful. Nowadays, many of us lay maps down on tables to place cardboard, wood, plastic, or metal pieces on them as we relive history or envision the future. Today, I'm going to be looking at some of the maps from the games in my collection, and I'll give my impression on what looks good, not so good, and what looks fantastic. This is the art of the game. These are magnificent maps, and you're watching What Does That Piece Do? Hello everyone, and welcome once again to What Does That Piece Do? My name is Joe. Thank you for tuning into this video. If you're used to watching this YouTube channel, it's probably because you were checking out my very structured tutorials and teaches of some of my favorite history games. And if you haven't been watching this channel, well, maybe now's a good time to subscribe because you don't want to miss a thing, right? Right. Okay, perfect, because today I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. I'm going to be doing a bit of an art critique of some of my favorite games in my collection. Now, I've done this before, actually. I did uh, an art critique of the art and design of cards and some of the CDGs, those history games, and really started to appreciate the aesthetic quality of them along with the functional quality. So I'm going to now do the same thing, but I'm going to turn that to the actual boards, and specifically boards in these games that feature maps. Now, I think you can tell I'm a big fan of maps, right? I really love looking at maps to really understand the world, understand the geography. I think you can learn a lot from them. When I'm reading a book that's got a map in it somewhere, uh, chances are I'm going to be reading a book with a map because I do read a lot of history and, and geography and politics. I'm always flipping back and forth. I'm going from the text back to that map because figure out where we're talking about, where are we going next in this story here? I really got to understand, you know, who's next to what, what's next to where and all that. Even I can think back to reading in high school, reading Lord of the Rings, going back and forth, uh, flipping back and forth between that map of Middle Earth. Going, where do the elves live? Where are they taking the hobbits to now? Where the heck is Mordor? Like it's really helpful to help me visualize it, understand where everything is. Maps can be very powerful. They can tell very powerful stories. Maps can lie. Maps can be a point of contention. As soon as you start drawing lines somewhere and saying these people live on this side or this belongs to us, then yeah, you could be causing some conflict as we see in games like this. It's where some conflict does arise. Uh, can cause some controversy. Even look at the Barbie movie that came out this summer. There was a map in that movie that really upset a bunch of people in the East. So, you know, maps are quite powerful. I think we can learn a lot from them when playing these games. It's kind of like the reverse of the book that I'm talking about. It's got a map in it. Well, now you're reading the map and then other text is coming forward to sort of aid that understanding and moving through the map. So really a, a big fan of games that do feature that. I critique because I care. I'm going to be offering some constructive criticism along the way, things I think that can be done better in some of these games, but I'm not out to bash any one artist or designer. I really, I know how hard it is to get your work out there, how brave you've got to be to put yourself forward with your, your creative output. So I'm not here to hate on anyone. I'm just offering a little bit of constructive critique of where I think things can be done better to really move the hobby forward. At the end of the day, I'm a lover, not a hater. And as you're going to see, a lot of this is going to be a bit of a love in for some of the beautiful maps that are out there and a real appreciation for them and in the design that really works and I hope can be emulated in other games we see down the road. So I've got seven games from my collection here. We're going to go through each one of those, talk about what's really great. I got a little bit of a grading system. I'm going to rate them out of 10 compasses because why not? Let's have a bit of fun with that. So let's take a look at them. Let's throw down these boards and take a look at these wonderful maps. All right, so the first game we're going to look at here is Shores of Tripoli. It's by Fort Circle Games. It's based in the early 1800s, and uh, it's on the north coast of Africa is where it takes place. So the Americans were coming in to battle the Barbary pirates here and uh, intercept them because they were wreaking havoc all along this coastline uh, in this period. Um, You'll notice this is basically a long map of the north coast of Africa, which is where it takes place. So a pretty faithful depiction of that 
region. Um, some folks might recognize this as they play a lot of those uh, North African World War II games. This coast might look familiar to you. So um, really beautiful map, beautiful colors, right? Um, very vibrant. You've got these uh, ports, which are very important here. Obviously, Tripoli being the biggest one, and all these other little ports, and they'll really help you understand, hey, what color pieces go where. It's really simple. It's uh, hard to mistake this. So the ports are definitely important, as are the patrol zones, which are clearly marked outside of them. That's where a lot of the action is going to take place. A lot of the ships are going to be coming to and fro. So uh, really clearly marked. All the spaces are clearly labeled. The font is great. They got a nice little bit of a border around them, so they're really easy to read. I mean. This is the trouble you might run into if you're using some very vibrant, very stark colors here. It's like sometimes your iconography, your text isn't going to pop out that well, but you do a really good job here of uh, making sure it stands out. And of course, you've got all the little like track markers here, like what year, what turn you're in. Uh, you've got the space for all your extra pieces that are going to be in supply here. With some really neat backgrounds to them for whichever faction they belong to. You know, beautiful borders. It's the little things here. It's just a little bit of flair. A lot of great textures going on in the, the land and in the sea. Um, it's not a complex game and there's not a lot of spaces on here so it's the one thing is like there's not a heck of a lot to to have to plan for for complexity when you're designing something like this but still i think they did a really great job of it like right on down these little details like the little flared out pieces of the little parts of the shoreline here with those little radiating lines i think are a really nice touch i think the artist did an amazing job there so um, with that said, uh, I think this is a great map, simple map, very, um, you know, kind of an easy assignment. So I'm still going to give it an 8 out of 10 compasses for this awesome map work on shores of Tripoli. Next game that we'll look at then is Land and Freedom, published by Blue Panther Games. This is a game set in the Spanish Civil War. Um, First thing I want to call out is the fact that it's Blue Panther. They do a lot of print-on-demand stuff. They try to keep costs low, and uh, therefore the component quality of their games isn't quite on the level that we'd expect from, say, like a Fort Circle or GMT games. Um, so just with that in mind, just know that the art was, I feel, a little bit of an afterthought here. A really amazing game. A lot of people are really hyped about this one, myself included. Been playing it a lot this year. Um, but I think the art is kind of um, not up to par with some of the other games we're going to look at. So first off, obviously, we've got a map of Spain here. Now, the map is divided into two sides where you see a lot of the, you know, the fascists and then the anti-fascists fighting back and the areas that they control through most of the Spanish Civil War. But it's really about these four fronts. So that's the important part of the game. It's that it has to be fought on these fronts. So the map itself isn't very crucial to have. I mean, it's interesting to see where the dividing lines are. And hey, you're doing a Spanish Civil War game. You gotta have a map of Spain, right? But really, it truly is about those four fronts. And you're not doing a lot of movement between the different areas. They just kind of battle there on their own. So not not super crucial to have this map. But it is interesting to see, you know, the names of the spaces where some of the uh, cards and events allude to like uh, you know Guadalajara, Terrell, um, Guernica of course but as you can see already we start to run into some issues looking at the names of the spaces on this map it's a little hard to decipher this this black on a dark rich red here so again not crucial to gameplay just kind of a point of interest um, the other side though of the board, which by the way it's canvas, uh, kind of cool, uh, you're definitely going to need the plexi for this if you're playing. The other side of the board here, this is like the political tracks, and there's some interesting stuff that goes on here. This is where the competitive side of the game is. Uh, as we can see, there's a lot of different icons on here, and well, I wouldn't even really call them icons, they're kind of pictures that have been shrunken down a little bit, um, so they're kind of hard to read when they're that small, and I'll say that about the cards as well. Like For example, you've got the uh, anarchist um, tract, they're worried about liberty and collectivization. Uh, at a glance, those uh, icons can kind of look similar, so they're kind of hard to parse at first. So I really would have preferred icons instead of these pictures that are being used. Uh, the tracks themselves are really neat. Interesting use of colors. Uh, I think they're quite bold colors. You know, when you take a step back and look at this game, it's really quite interesting. This uh, sort of spectrum of these reds and purples and, and blues and whatnot. Um, but then sometimes it does get hard to read certain things. Like if you're starting to read the numbers here in this dark purple, rich purple, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on there. I mean, obviously, 7, 8, 9, 10, but 
it's hard to see that this one track can't move until another track is at a certain level. So if you're trying to read that, it might be a little tough here. But once you get the flow of the game, it's pretty easy to understand. Aesthetically, it's not the best. There's some neat sort of background stuff happening here. A couple of images uh, sort of faded into the background. There's a bit of neat texture here on a map, which again, map isn't super crucial. Um, so there's not a lot of artistry going on here. Um, but the game is really good. Uh, so I'm going to be a little harsh on the art here. I'm only going to give it a 6 out of 10 compasses. Which I know that sounds mean, but if anything, I'm hoping... Uh, this really encourages a future publisher that wants to pick up this game and maybe in five or ten years do a deluxe version of it where the art is really going to be outstanding and it would bring this game to the next level. Already an amazing game, but just imagine how awesome it would be with really beautiful, well-developed art. Okay, and next we have The Red Burnous, which is by Hit em With A Shoe uh, Publishers. Um, taking us back to North Africa, specifically into Algeria, into the mountain range, uh, the Tizi Uzo province. Already you can see it's going to be a bit of a challenge if you're trying to do a landlocked region here without any specific features like waterways or coastlines or anything like that. But that said, it is a very beautiful map. It's like a hand-painted style here. Uh, one of the amazing things about this game is the fact that they actually got an Algerian artist, I believe, from this region to actually do the art. So that is pretty incredible, and it really shows. Um, it's bold, it's beautiful. You still get a sense of this mountain range and the land itself, uh, even if there is very few waterways and really none that figure into the game itself. Um, these roads here, now these are connecting points between the different regions. They could have been straight lines. You know, you see that in a lot of games, which just shows adjacency, just a line from here to there. Um, these are winding roads that really give you a sense of the shape of the land. And you got these switchbacks going all uh, up and down these mountains here. So uh, pretty cool uh, little flair uh, to this game. Where things start to get let down a little bit, though, is more in like the use of the text and some of the graphics and the in, the icons that are on here. They're pretty lackluster. They've got some pretty basic shapes and basic colors. Um, the text, it's uh, it's it's legible for sure, but just that that halo effect is it, it's a bit much. But again, because we've got such uh, bright, beautiful colors on the board. Um, you got to make sure that your text shows up, so they had to put a lot of effect on it. But the text that really kind of bugs me a little is all this extra text here about the combat overview. Now, this is a very kind of war gamey type of thing. It's like you got to put like a big chunk of the rule book on the board just so that you can remember how combat works. But in this case, combat is something where you could go a whole game and combat might not even happen. You could actually go out and try and snipe these armies that are coming towards you and actually have a round of combat. So I think it's an odd choice to put that on there. It kind of breaks the beauty of this board here. Just all that haloing going on and you know, this extra stuff. It could have been a card. It could have been a little player aid card. And they do have some player aid cards uh, to go along with this game for actual battle resolution. But like maybe this could be spelled out on it and just you know leave the board a bit more as is. But another thing I do like though from the iconography I guess you could say is these really cool looking chevrons here that show you know where the armies are going to start from. It's got this really neat uh, this zigzag pattern with really uh, amazing beautiful colors and that translates really well onto the cards which has some great design but then also has some kind of rough icons on them that kind of let the game down. I actually covered this game in my uh, card design uh, critique as well and you'll see there's, there's some similarities between what's really good and what's not so good uh, in the art in this game but overall I really got to applaud them for the use of the uh, actual artists that's native to this region that contributed the artwork here I think they did a beautiful amazing job just kind of let down by some of the um, the lettering and the, the graphics on here so I will give this one a seven compasses out of ten Now we're going to go further back in time to uh, The Wars of Marcus Aurelius, which is released on Hollenspiel Games. It is set in 170 CE. This is in Pannonia Superior, which is a slice of the Roman Empire's frontier along the Danube in Eastern Europe. So which today I believe is like a crossing over with Austria. I'll say I was pretty harsh on this game from the card design aspect because uh, like, there's really not much design in those cards at all. It's kind of disappointing considering how beautiful this map looks. Like, look at this. This is gorgeous. 
really, really nice, vibrant colors, but muted colors. So this is where you give yourself a little bit more flexibility if you're designing something like this. If you have these sort of muted tones in the background that still show distinct areas, um, it's easier than to put other text on top and then to put other pieces on top so you can see what's going on when you're playing this game. Um, so some really uh, wonderful colors to show the distinct regions, um, some little bit of you know mountain ranges and stuff here, uh, just to show some divisions, shows the dividing line of the Danube. For one thing, the actual paper map itself is like a parchment. And then the map, the design of the map is meant to look like parchment as well. So it's like, yo dog, I heard you like parchment. I put a parchment map on your parchment board so you could be looking at parchment while you're playing on parchment. Another game is probably going to require the plexi, but anyway, under glass, it looks beautiful too. Uh, lots of beautiful textures going on on the map. You know, very subtle lines in some cases. You got these little white lines, but you can tell, you know, there's little arrows going across. Maybe the arrows are the least imaginative thing, but like it shows you where these, these bad guys are progressing towards you. But even like the strength on the map to show like how strong they are. You know, the, the further they get from their homeland, they're less strong, so they're easier to battle. But it's like, you put it there, four plus three, seven. That's the strength you gotta be. Really easy, really straightforward uh, to read. Uh, beautiful fonts as well. You got the other side here where you're gonna have some cards being played into. Um, it's a card-driven game, like I say, with some really neat kind of rustic borders along the outside. The borders are all very similar, but they all have that rustic quality, which is just nice. Just adds that little bit of flair. Um, some great SPQR icons on there and some other, uh, not sure how accurate this is, but hey, this is some other uh, sort of barbarian looking lettering on here, which is, I don't know, just adds to some of the flair overall. So there really are so many good things to say about this game, the map itself and how gorgeous it is. Shame about the cards, but hey, that aside, if we just look at the map itself and how beautiful it is, I can give this a really high mark. I'm gonna give this one nine compasses out of 10. And now let's go even further back in time, shall we, to the Peloponnesian War, as depicted in the game Polis by De Vere Games. This is actually the second edition of this game. Uh, the earlier version, very similar, but it's a different map. This map is very vibrant and colorful compared to the uh, older map. Uh, you can see all the different locations here, all the different uh, areas on the board, they all have their distinct color, very bright, very beautiful. Obviously the most important thing about the game is being able to take over the different Polish. You can see them here, they're all marked with the specific numbers and strengths of what it's going to take to conquer those and what they're going to yield ultimately. It, there's two big ones, obviously Sparta and Athens, the two factions uh, going head to head in this game. So you can tell they're very important here, they got a different color, but otherwise everything's very clearly marked. Um, you yeah, got some terrain here, terrain doesn't matter too much, but just a nice little effect here and some textured lines in the water as well. Uh, the divisions in the water, though, might get a little bit trickier to understand. Like you can see pathways here are these dark dotted lines, but then the actual division lines between the seas are these white lines. So that might be a little tricky to decipher and understand at first, but there's only a handful of them. You're only going to be doing so much stuff in the sea, I think, in this game. So it's not that big of a deal. Uh, but, you know, otherwise it is a beautiful map. I think it's uh, really, you know, clearly marked. It's very accurate to the region, um, which there was a discussion in a recent... Uh, uh, podcast we had on the Fred Serval's Homo Lens podcast where a bunch of us had played this and discussed the game and there was some discussion around whether this is a Euro game or a war game because yeah there's some war but it's mostly about resource collection um, so, you know the colors might make you think it's a bit of a Euro game but I said that because the map is so accurate and not distorted that makes it more of like a history war game but then if you look at well specifically Sicily here uh, I'll tell you you can probably guess already, it's not that close to Greece. It's actually like 400 kilometers away off the boot of Italy, but it was a very important region uh, for the Greek city-states at this time, where they're getting a lot of their grain from is depicted in this game. So, okay, they took a couple of liberties there. They kind of shortened the distance there. Otherwise, I still I maintain the coastlines and everything are very accurate. Um, you see Sicily that close, but you don't see Crete. I guess Crete wasn't really that important in this uh, in the Peloponnesian War. Uh, been to Crete actually, it's very beautiful. Santorini's on here though somewhere I think. Santorini's beautiful too. 
I'll have to go back someday. This really makes me want to go back to Greece. Anyway, that's the one side of the board. The other side, though, is the more the economic engine here, where as you take control of certain city-states, then you get to put your little cubes in here, if you've got them in there, to say how much of a certain resource you're going to take. So, oh, by the way, nice little notches in here in this notched board. It's a really super thick board, but that's so you can do things like this. And uh, I think that's pretty cool. We're starting to get into some 3D elements here, which I'm usually not a fan of, but hey, this is pretty neat. And you can see the icons for the different resources. They're pretty distinct, pretty easy to read, mostly color-based. You'll go and pick them up on other areas of the board too. So pretty easy to navigate. Um, like I said, it's very visually stunning, visually beautiful. You know, we could have made it this stark looking war-torn landscape, which we're supposed to believe is happening at this time. Um, but they went with some really vibrant, beautiful colors. And I really do think that works. So I will give this one an 8.5 compasses out of 10. going to bring us back into the modern era now in the 20th century the game called 1979 revolution in iran is published by the deets foundation um, this actually spans uh, a couple decades as you can see here from the 1950s all the way up to 1979 when the actual uh, iranian revolution in the khomeini ayatollah khomeini came into power then uh, so it spans a few decades um, but we have this uh, pretty wonderful map of iran and all the important cities um, that really haven't changed much even since then, so they're all very uh, current uh, naming conventions and everything. But yeah, it uh, shows you exactly what the important parts are. Like these cities are all clearly denoted here. Um, they really pop out with the text and whatnot. Tehran is obviously a bit of a big deal, and there's a bunch of symbols around that. Ooh, I wonder if Tehran is a very valuable point of interest here in the game. Um, it's a bit bigger. This is where I talk about you just got the straight lines, usually between locations in a lot of games, unlike... Um, uh, Red Bernoose, but uh, just shows you the adjacency, which is what you need to know. A uh, lovely texture to the map. Other locations that are of importance are these oil resource locations. There's one that's actually not even a city. It's just specifically an oil resource location. you got two other cities that are like that. So they are clearly marked. You should be able to see them right away. You've got, um, interestingly, uh, Azerbaijan is here sticking into Iran. It's like a, an adjacent region. So that's a, maybe a slight point of confusion. So you got to look at the rule book to understand why it is like that. But it's actually adjacent to uh, Tabriz in, in Tehran here. All the borders, all the textures are lovely. The borders along the outside. And then you've got these it's overflow boxes, again, because you're going to start to run into a little bit of trouble if you're starting to stack up some of your pieces into certain spaces. It's going to get a little bit heavy. And then you've got these other boxes for other things to, to mark stuff uh, along the way. You've got the, you know, these leaders in power, again, using this really powerful font, this other tracks here, which are very important. Uh, there's also the event and activity tracker down along the bottom here. Um, you know, kind of, you know, pretty straightforward. The font isn't that you know, interesting here, but it's, you know, very small text. So you got to just kind of make some concessions there, I think, to make it uh, legible. And you're going to be putting markers on there just to show that uh, you've used certain cards or executed certain activities. You've got these, you know, kind of like sandy brown beige tones. This might be a bit of beige for you, but the colors really do start to pop on the board when you start to put the actual faction pieces on here and you get a lot more, you know, lively colors going on. Uh, with all these wonderfully colored pieces. So once it starts to come together, the board state is really quite interesting and quite beautiful. And you get um, a lot of variety and it kind of you know changes up the look and, and feel of the board at that point. And of course, along the border of the map too, again, I'm a sucker for this. Just all these little edges that are kind of like burnt looking edges or torn out of a, hastily torn out of a book somehow. Someone's running away with the map or whatever. Just some really cool stuff. One thing I will say is like all this beiginess kind of is compounded by this extra border along the outside. Now there's some beautiful sort of like Persian mosaic looking textures in there, which are really nice. But you just kind of see that in a lot of different places on the board and on the cards themselves. So that might be a little much. So if you maybe, you know, strip it back one step, maybe either make that a white or maybe a marbly border like we've got over here on some of these tracks or make it black or just maybe extend the map out so it goes right to the edges. I think that'd be a little bit better because otherwise it's like um, when you got too many accessories on as you're about to go out on the night out, um, you might want to take a look in the mirror and take off one accessory just to look. 
ideal. Um, I will say, I think at one point this uh, this map was a bit darker when they were prototyping it and uh, going through some play tests. And I believe like an Iranian person that was actually playing it uh, took a look and said, look, can you make it look a little less like Mordor, a little less evil looking map here? And they kind of stripped back some of the, the darker, harsher colors. And that, I think I made for a more, you know, neutral type of game here. So, uh, but otherwise I think all the imagery is great. The graphics are great. The text is great. Um, the map is great. So this is a really uh, well-designed, functional, but also a lot of great texture and flair in this map. So I'm going to give this one 8 out of 10 compasses. And finally, we're going to head back to kind of where we started at the beginning of this. Uh, we're talking Shores of Tripoli, but now we're looking at Granada, last stand of the Moors from Compass Games. This takes place in the south of Spain. Also elements of North Morocco come into play here, so back into the Mediterranean. For those that don't know, this uh, game is based on the same system as Seki Gahara from GMT Games, where you've got blocks and then cards to play those blocks as you move them around and whatnot. So it uses a lot of the same stuff with a little bit more chrome. But let's take a look at this map, you know, uses the same kind of map style too, right? You've got these little tiny points between these different cities that you got to travel to. And some roads can be traveled, some aren't, some are major highways, some aren't. So that's denoted here. Um, little tiny points. And then, you know, the, the actual locations are they're kind of small, a little hard to read here. It's not too important. It's more important when they've got these little symbols around them or where the specific types of armies can muster to. Or specifically, you've got these uh, different castles and lookout towers here. So with these small points, the same thing in Saga Gihara, you got these big blocks going to these small points, so it's kind of hard to show where they're actually going to sit. Um, you kind of have to like group them together. Uh, you should be able to stack them. This game is a bit harder to stack the blocks because they're a little bit of a different uh, kludgy size here to deal with. But anyway, as long as you, you, everyone knows where everyone is, uh, it's kind of fun. It looks pretty cool actually when all the, the blocks get onto the board. Um, so you got to have these sort of winding lines between them too. They can't just all be adjacent because some you can't traverse to from one to the next. So you got to have the lines to basically go between these little dots, I think. So uh, kind of cool. I like to sort of push the guys along as they're approaching and they're going to attack. And it kind of feels a little bit more dramatic that way, <laughs> which is pretty cool. So it's, it's really nice that they use some of those subdued colors to kind of be a little bit background as you're placing blocks on there. Like you got the light red here is the Moors region where they start out for the most part. And then the green is the Christians region. And so it leaves a lot of room for some iconography uh, and text and for the blocks to really show up on the map, which, you know, they do look good when, once you get playing and get everything on there. Overall, it's, it's pretty nice. It's, it's got a really neat feel to it. It feels kind of like an old medieval map for the most part. Um, I do have a few small quibbles though, you know. Um, that is, you know, the way the text sticks out. Yeah, not that big of a deal, but there are these areas that you have to have starting blocks in and it'll show you on the map. Like for example, down here in the south, you've got this extra little square here that's supposed to denote one of these blocks, which are rectangles. They're not exactly squares. Um, so it's kind of weird that that's, that's the shape that they use. Like This is the shape because these actual square shapes, they do end up on certain points of the board to uh, denote resource locations. So when you see two symbols that look like that, it's like, oh, okay, I guess I put two of those there, right? Isn't that what that means? No, it's... Those are for the rectangle blocks, so it's, it's like a little thing, it's just to start things off, but like, come on, it's that attention to details, like, come on, you gotta develop this just a little bit further and just make it all look right and make sense, so just little silly stuff like that that I've got to quibble with. It's not a deal breaker, though, at the end of the day, it's a really neat game and it plays really cool. Uh, some of the other things like the tracks and stuff, again, they're using cool fonts and like the, the turn marker here along the top. Oh, that's pretty cool. It looks like, you know, a medieval banner it just doesn't have much life or texture to it compared to the rest of the board. So it's got this nice sort of like uh, drop shadow so it sticks out a little bit. Looks pretty cool. And then it's, you know, the texture's just not there. I think you know by now I like textures in a lot of the boards that I've been uh, looking at today. But uh, hey, all the other little elements are neat. You look at the, the water, you've got your... Of course, you gotta have your funky little monster fish in there. Uh, you can't have a good old medieval map without a monster fish, so.
There he is. And with that, you know, just because of those kind of minor mistakes and a little attention to detail, I'd like to see a bit better. It's a really nice looking board, some great art and design elements going on here, but I'll give this seven compasses out of 10. So there you go. There's seven different unique moments in history. Their stories all told through seven different maps and seven different games. What do you think? Do you agree or disagree with my assessment here? Uh, was I way off base or did I hit it right on the mark? You tell me, I'd love to hear what do you value in the art and design of a map on a board on a game that you're playing? Does it even matter to you? As long as it's a functional map and you can read it, are you happy? Or do you want something that's truly got a visual aesthetic quality that really sucks you into the game? I'd love for you to sound off in the comments. Let me know what do you prefer. Do you have an opinion on this at all? Let's keep that dialogue open. I'd love to discuss this more and more with folks out there watching. But thank you for watching. I'm glad you could tune in today. Uh, please do check out some of the other videos on this channel, including if you like this one, check out the one on card design too. That might be right up your alley. But for now, I hope you're enjoying whatever it is you're playing. Have a great day. And I hope to see you at the table someday. Cheers.